Welcome back everyone. So in the previous video, we discussed why we have to encode the categorical values so that you know they become the target uh, values during training. Now, we also have to encode and tokenize the titles. And now if you don't know what either of those meant, then you're in the right place because we're going to be discussing it, right? So as I mentioned before, we can't just feed text like this into a model. We have to convert it in a way that the model understands it, okay? So now I'm going to show you a diagram. And this diagram shows the BERT-based model and the distilled BERT-based model. And the focus is not on the BERT-based versus the distilled BERT-based model right now, okay? But just so you guys understand, the BERT-based model is a larger and a little more accurate model than the distilled BERT-based model. We are going to be fine-tuning a distilled BERT model. It is still massive and really big, but as the name suggests, the distill, hence the distilled meaning smaller, it's a smaller version of the BERT model. And for our task, it's going to be performing at a 99% accuracy. So we don't need to convert to a BERT-based model. And I'm going to talk a lot about model architecture, about key value query, multi-head attention, the transform layers. So don't worry if you don't understand everything right now. The reason I'm showing you this diagram is to show that regardless of what kind of model you use, you first have to tokenize the text. As you can see, this is the first step, tokenizing the step, and then you feed it into the embedding layer. Okay, now you see that these two model architectures, by the way, are really similar, and that's because they are almost exactly the same, except that the BERT-based model has a lot more layers and parameters, but again, we will discuss that in more detail later. What you need to understand right now First, regardless of the model, we have to tokenize the text. Once we tokenize the text, we can feed it into the embedding layer, and then it goes through the transform layers, and then we have an output, okay? But how does that work? And now, shout out to Václav Kovsar for this, because this is going to get us started. It's not going to get us where we want to be, but this diagram is going to get us started, okay? so. We first have this text. For example, this is a input text. Then we have to tokenize it. And this is the tokenization process. Now, don't worry if you don't know what CLS or SEP means here. We're going to discuss that in the coming videos. But what you have to understand it, the tokenization is that it first chops up the uh, words in the sentence into other words or subwords. So sometimes this could be in and put. It doesn't necessarily mean that each word is going to be treated uh, separately, okay? It could be subword based tokenization. So, you know, depending on the tokenization model, right now this shows input as one, but it could be in and put, okay? And then once we have that, we encode it, code these tokens into their respective numbers. Now, you know, this might be the tricky part and we're going to discuss this. So why is CLS 101? Why is A, you know, 1037? So don't worry, we are going to discuss that. And once we have the tokenizations, then we feed it into the embedding layer. What you need to know about the embedding layer is, as I mentioned, we're going to talk more about it, but a step-by-step, -step, you know, workflow is you create an embedding from the tokens and that happens by applying an embedding matrix to the tokens and it's important to know that the embedding matrix so for example the embedding matrix over here is learned through back propagation for your custom data okay so we are going to be tuning that so when you see the embeddings the embeddings basically means it's a, a dot product it takes for example this token, this 101, it applies the embedding matrix to it and it's going to convert it into these values. And now these values represent 101. These values, so these values in the second column represent 2023, which you know is the encoding that belongs to the token for this, okay? So I hope this makes sense that first you tokenize it once you tokenize it, you encode it. And then once you encode it, 
you apply the embedding matrix to these encoded values. So for example, 2023 is the encoded version for the word or the token, this. And once we apply the embedding matrix to it, it's going to convert it into a multi-dimensional vector, okay? What you need to understand is the embedding layer is trained, okay? So just like any other layer, the embedding matrix is trained on your own data. So obviously the training is going to be faster because these models have been uh, trained already on large corpus of, of text. So it's not like you train the embedding layer from scratch, but you just have to fine tune it for your own custom data. Okay. And now the million dollar question, how or, or why is this 101 representing this CLS? Why is this 2023 representing this? And this is actually called the vocabulary. Okay. So the vocabulary size of distill BERT is 30,522 tokens. And this is actually the same size as the vocabulary for the original large BERT model. Okay. So in order for you to understand this, these 30,522 tokens were originally trained on English text. So they perform best on English language tasks. Okay. What you need to understand is right now in our tokenization vocabulary for distill BERT, we have 30,000 tokens. So that means that a number, for example, for input, you see a 7,953. This is you know, 7,953. And these, each of these numbers represent a different token. And these tokens were trained with the word piece tokenization method. Okay. So first you create a large text corpus, and then you start with individual characters and special tokens. And then you iteratively merge frequent pairs of tokens into subword units. Okay. Now this process continues until we have a vocabulary. And I know, you know, this might be a little confusing at first, but it's essential that you understand that these tokens right now, our token vocabulary for this model is 30,522 tokens. And these 30,522 tokens are popular English words and subwords. And by subword, I mean, you know, for example, for unhappiness, you can create unhappiness from two words and un, which is a negation, which means, you know, it's the opposite of, of happy. So un and happiness and un could be a token and then happiness could be a token. And so I wanted to show you guys one of my LinkedIn posts. So I'm, I'm fairly active on LinkedIn. So feel free to follow me. I usually post uh, educational things, but here's a post that I, I created. So have you ever wondered how tokenization algorithms can understand words they've never seen before? So this is the example I was talking about, right? So consider the word unhappiness. And unhappiness in itself might not be in the vocabulary for distilled BERT, right? But using subword tokenization, it can be broken down into subword tokens, un and happiness. As I mentioned, un is a prefix indicating negation. And happiness is a common word where, you know, the double hashtag indicates that it is a continuation of a previous token. And this approach allows tokenization algorithms, such as the ones that we are using for distill BERT, to recognize and interpret new words by understanding their subword components. Okay. So for instance, even if unhappiness is, is novel and it's not in the, you know, our tokenization vocabulary, the algorithm can piece together its meaning from known parts. So the algorithm might know that un means a prefix indicating negation, and it might know that happiness, you know, is a state of mind where you are joyful. Now, there comes a question. For example, we have the word display, and the word display demonstrates how subword tokenization can accurately differentiate between words with similar sequences of characters. So instead of misinterpreting display as, you know, dis and play, the algorithm recognizes it as a single cohesive token due to its common usage and context within the vocabulary. Okay. So this is what you have to understand with these, uh, you know, and I don't want to talk too much about the vocabulary because it's outside of the scope of this course. You're not going to need it in, in machine learning that much because these are already provided for you, but I just want you to understand. So 
in order for us to convert these tokens into encoded tokens, we basically look them up. So this belongs to the token 2023 and is belongs to the token 2003. And these tokens are learned through this algorithm that I mentioned. It's called the word piece tokenization method, which means that, you know, you give the tokenization algorithm, this word piece uh, tokenization method, millions of text. Okay. So like Wikipedia pages, research papers, and iteratively, it will find the most common words and subwords. And based off of that, it's going to be able to create a vocabulary that, you know, is able to understand 99% of the English language. Now, as I mentioned before, the Distill BERT model that we're building was originally trained on English texts, like English Wikipedia, English research papers, okay? But there are multilingual BERT models. That means they understand more language. Now, they are generally larger, both in, you know, in vocabulary size. And so in when you look at the model itself, because it has a larger vocabulary, it has it requires a larger space. So it's going to be a larger model because it has a vocabulary. Okay. So for example, the multilingual BERT, or often referred to as M BERT, has a token size of 119,547 tokens. And it's able to translate uh, text into many languages because it has this large token size, this large token vocabulary, okay? So our model is for the English language and it has 32,000 words in its vocabulary. But if you want to train your model on something that is not English, you might have to look at something like the Embert model, as I mentioned, which its vocabulary size is almost, you know, like five times larger than our BERT, our distilled BERT vocabulary. And the reason for that is because it has been trained on not only English text. Okay. So I hope that gave you a small understanding of how we encode these tokens. And we're going to be in the next video, I'm going to talk about, for example, what is this CLS? What is the separator and how we basically take these tokens and encode them. Okay. So what I was hoping to achieve in this lecture is that you to understand how we can convert this token, for example, this and encode it into a token from the vocabulary. Okay. So I don't want to confuse anyone, but if we have, you know, a sentence over here, the maximum amount of number that you could see on the bottom would be, I'll give you a second to, to think it would be 30,522, right? So any number in this, whatever sentence you put in, the tokens is going to be between one and 30,522, okay? Because that's how large our vocabulary is. You know, it turns out that for input, the token is the 7,953, okay? And then remember, once we have these tokens, we apply the embedding matrix to it and it will transform the word such as input into a meaningful representation of a number. Okay. So that the model understands and don't be confused. This only shows that, you know, for example, the input is converted into seven, nine, five, three, and that's converted into these three numbers. But in reality, these are multiple hundred or, or thousands of long vectors. Okay. So the embeddings, for input over here, you see it's represented by three numbers, but in reality, this uh, input, this word here is represented by, you know, a vector that has a size of multiple hundred or multiple thousand. Okay. So this would be one, two, three, so on, so on. It could reach the thousands. So it's kind of fascinating how you represent a single word such as input with hundreds or thousands of numbers. And that's how the model is able to learn right? Because we tokenize the text, we have the embedding layer, and the embedding layer is responsible for converting the tokenized text into something that the model understands. And then it will start off the, basically the transform layer, which, and each transform layer, as you can see, has the key value query, multi-head attention, and we're going to be talking about this in greater detail. So I hope you understand how we turn these uh, tokens into encodings and how we turn those encodings 
into embeddings. So I will see you in the next lecture where we continue talking about tokenization.